Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And this is the final chapter in the Sex and the City and Just Like That trilogy. And it's going to be a great one because we have Jenny Bix. Now, Jenny Bix is an incredibly prolific Emmy-winning writer and producer, having executive produced The Big C with Laura Linney, written the screenplay for The Greatest Showman. She wrote on Seinfeld and Dawson's Creek, which we're not skipping over, Jenny. Bring it, bring it. But let's face it, the reason for the season is that Jenny Bix was also the co-executive producer and wrote on all six seasons of Sex and the City. Jenny Bix, we have a lot to discuss. <laughs> bring it. How bring are it. You? How are you? Thank you so much for doing this. This is like... I'm good. I'm excited to chat. I'm I'm excited that I haven't gotten COVID yet in almost two years of this crazy bullshit. So you're a New Yorker, right? Like, I know you live in L.A. now, but aren't you a New Yorker? I am. I'm a born and bred Manhattan girl. Um, where yeah, did, where did you go to high school? I like to play this game. Let's play a game. Where do you think I went to high school? It, you grew up in Manhattan? I grew up in Manhattan. I grew up in the Upper East Side. Oh, okay. Well, now you're giving it away. Um, Well, I may or may not be, but yes, I think I am. I like to think that my personality matches where I went to school, but that's also perhaps not right. Did you, okay. Did you go to Spence? I did not go to Spence, but you are not far off. So my, my old therapist went to Spence. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I had that right on the tip of my tongue. That's interesting. I like that idea. I don't know why you associated me with your therapist, but that's for another call. That's, that's for another one. time. The I, only- do you want me to tell you? Mm, can I have one more guess? Yeah, you, you can get, I think you can get it. If you, you know, just think. Like, was, it an all, was it an all girls school? It was, it was, and still is. Brearly. I went to Brearley. Yeah, I did. You know who else? I don't know if you're going to get this. So I, another guest of mine went to Brearley. Do you, this is so niche, but did you watch America? Do you know who Kim Stoles is from America's Next told, Top Model? First of all, I totally watched all of America's Top Model and I do know who she is and she's awesome. She went there. I know. And I found that out like in the last five years and I was so excited because I think she's so rad. And I, like I, that made me very excited. Talk about I a New Yorker. Like- in, in my interview with her, we talked all about how she opened that lesbian place, the Dalloway. Yeah. I don't know if you ever was there, but it was it was fabulous, like at a time. No, I think it was after I left New York that that took off. But she and also how great was she on Top Model? I mean, that's a whole separate conversation. We can talk about Top Model, but whatever. She was like almost too good for Top Model. You were living in New York during your entire run of Sex and the City? No, actually, at, by the point we were doing the show, there were so there were three of us who kind of started on the show, Darren Starr, myself and Michael Patrick King. And we were all actually living in L.A. At, at that point, but came back to New York to shoot. So we would kind of work in L.A. for a couple months and then come to New York for a couple months and go back and forth. And that's what we continued to do the whole time, which was kind of oh, great. The other women on the show, where were they living? Some of them were in L.A. and then some were in New York. Okay. So by the end of it, most of the writers were based in New York, except for Michael and myself. But we would live in New York for probably six or seven months out of the year, which was super important because, as you know, the show had some so much energy of New York that you kind of couldn't you could come up with some ideas in L.A., but you needed to be in New York to kind of live it. So before we fully jump into Sex in the City, I want to quickly highlight a few other things. What was your involvement with Dawson's Creek. <laughs> I like that. Let's go back. Let's go back in time. I mean, the Mom. Dawson's Creek, I mean, formative for me. Formative, formative for me. Well, he, it actually has a, a Sex in the City component in that I started working on Sex in the City. I wrote episode nine of the show um, as a freelance script when it was just uh, Michael and Darren. And we shot the whole first season, but we hadn't aired yet. So we didn't air so we didn't know what was going to happen with the show we didn't know if the show would be picked up for a second season and so I needed girl needed a job um and so I went back to LA and looked for a job that was just kind of two to three days a week so I could leave myself open and I ended up as a consulting producer on Dawson's Creek for season two and it was awesome it was so fun it was the first time I'd ever written a one-hour show which is quite different than writing comedy or a half hour. 
but it was iconic and it was so fun to write like these teenagers talking like kind of adults and having adult situations, but also kind of soap opera. So it was, it was awesome. I had so much fun. What does it mean to be a consultant on a show? But yet you also wrote episodes as well? Yes. Yeah. So a consultant basically just means you're not working full time. So it's kind of the best of everything because you get to experience something without being on the hook all the time. For- and what Dawson's storylines did you really have a hand in? Because wait, I'm thinking season two, that was when the gay character, right? Isn't Correct. that when Jack yeah. came out? Yeah. That's when Jack came out. And it's funny because looking back on, so the other people working on the show at that time, Greg Berlanti was a staff writer on the, on the show. So Greg was like our baby writer. Um, Mike White, was also on it. Oh Mike was God. also a consultant with me. And so we had all these fantastic writers and the Jack character kind of came out of these discussions of, listen, and, and it was really revolutionary when you look back, like there weren't, which is really tragic, of course, too. They're like, there weren't those kind of gay characters. And then to have a character like Jack and have him develop the way he did, it was, it was amazing. Kevin Williamson, who, by the way, also created Scream, which like, yeah. it's so funny that like, that's even relevant today. Again, um, you know, the movie just came out. Yes, totally. out. But I remember Kevin Williamson had said that every character on Dawson's Creek was like a part of his personality. I think I think that is true. And I think that's what made it good was that he was able to take each of these characters, even if he wasn't like Joey like in real life, he was, he had a part of Joey. And that's what we say about, I think any good show, like on Sex and the City, we, you know, there was that time where like Cosmo would do these quizzes, like which character are you on Sex and the City? And the truth of it was, we used to joke in the room. It's like, we all were all the characters. Like you can't, if you're going to be a good writer, you need to have a part of those characters in you. Um, Some of us had more than others, you know, some had more Samantha, some had more um, Carrie, but uh, that's, that's what makes a good writer, I think. And two other fun facts about your previous credits. Again, before we we really dive into Sex and the City, you wrote on Seinfeld. Was Seinfeld like your first big break? It kind of was. Seinfeld, I had worked on a bunch, which is what you do when you come out. If you're lucky, you get to come out to Hollywood and write on shitty um, sitcoms, which was the era I was in. It was all, it was all sitcoms. And so I would write on like slightly better, slightly better sitcoms. And then like a sitcom that would go for like a year which was a big deal. And then I was on one that had gone for two years. And then I got this job to work on Seinfeld, which was kind of like, oh my God, it was, you know, I'd reached the pinnacle, I thought. What season did you write on? It was the last season. Oh, okay. I I got hired on the last season and I ended up leaving to do Sex and the City. And, but um, I was fired off Seinfeld before I even wrote a word. And I, to this day, I consider it a blessing because I would not have been able to be available to do Sex in the City. But let's just say that I, I don't think, you know, I don't think Jerry enjoyed me. And uh, I don't know what I did wrong, but uh, yeah. So this is a, a really good learning thing for anyone that you think you've reached like the place where, oh my God, it's all going to happen. And then it comes crashing down. There's always going to be another option. And that option was the better option for me. I was not meant to be working. It was, it was a world of a lot of guys um, and they uh, didn't necessarily enjoy having a female there. Was Larry David around? I know that Larry David wrote the final episode, but was he around during that final season? Larry was not around. No. Okay. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So, yeah. Okay. And then the final fun fact that the I, I want the audience to know is that you did punch-ups or like you're sort of an uncredited writer on one of the greatest rom-coms ever written, the Drew Barrymore vehicle, Never Been Kissed. Never Been Kissed. I'm also in it, by the way. It is my only acting credit <laughs> for all the right reasons. That is, that's my claim to fame. That's amazing. Have you done punch-ups? What, what is there, is there a technical name for that? I'm using the term punch-ups, but what, isn't there a real name for that job? Yeah, we're uh, rewriting is what it is. So there's a difference to us as writers between punch-up is more um, 
surgical, like you're going through and literally punching up a joke. Rewriting is you're going in a really, I spent a year on that film, for instance, like I rewrote the script. Wow. And and then was on set rewriting. So that's, that was a, that was more than just doing a uh, punch up. That's a rewrite job. Yeah. And why don't they credit, like when movies come out, why don't, why is the name that's attached the like written by, it's not the person who rewrote, like, why don't they include, it was really written by three different people. Like, why don't they do that? Well, it's a really good question. They're actually changing it right now. The Writers Guild is a Writers Guild rule, and it was designed to protect the original writer so that you get credit for what you actually created. The problem is exactly what you're describing, which is a lot of us come in and then work on things and don't get any kind of credit unless you, you arbitrate with the Writers Guild. And sometimes you win the arbitration, sometimes you don't. In that case, actually, it was a very... Um, unfortunate arbitration. Um, and I don't, no one likes arbitrating against other writers and like, we're all in it together, but you want credit for what you did. So I think the guild, we just voted on this and I should know, but I, I think they're adding something at the end that will be like additional literary material by, so at least you, you have some semblance of credit. That's great. Which is fair. I think, I think we should do that. Yeah, that's really great. And I, I had recently interviewed Leah Delaria and she told me how it was, re- she was in the first wives club and she told me how it was actually this other guy that like totally rewrote all of the first wives club and he's not credited. It was just like yeah, it, it, it's, interesting. It's painful. And it, it, it's, but it's also, look, we've all as writers, you stick around long enough, you're on the A side and you're on the B side. But you want writers to get credit. Like writers should be able to say, hey, listen, I, I helped with this. It's, because that's how it that's how it is in music. You look at a Beyonce song, there's 18 writers attached to it. Right. right. Like right. it should be. The, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. The time has come. OK, let's talk. Let's talk. So the, the first thing I want to say, I mean, I want to get into everything with you. I mean, you have actually written some of my favorite episodes of Sex in the City, and I have perhaps never been more prepared for an interview in my life because in gearing up for and just like that, I actually rewatched the entirety of Sex in the City. Holy shit, you're going to be like way more prepared than me. Like you're going to remember stuff I don't remember I wrote. So let's just go on record as saying, listeners, don't be don't be surprised if I sound like I have dementia. Okay. <laughs> so I guess just just to start, I want to go through the main women and just get very quickly, we're going to really like surgically go into it. But if you, we can start um, going through the characters and tell me a story that really came from you and then we can like really dive into it let's just like start with Carrie and then we'll go down the line okay let's see all of us had a lot of stories that went to Carrie but the one that um I mean the two that I think come to mind for me one was you know the episode that I think I'm in some ways most proud of which is a woman's right to shoes that I went to a party. This all started because I went to a party and look, I am not a, a tall lady. Um, I am five one on a good day. And so you tell me to put together an outfit for a party. I'm going to, uh, my shoe choice is going to be really integral. Right. And I went to a friend's party and was told that I had to take my shoes off. And it was very upsetting to me from a, from a, an outfit point of view, but also of course I look at this like, total mishmash of shoes there. And I'm like, oh my God, what if my shoes aren't there at the end of this party? And that became the jumping off point for what was a a bigger story because we were all, um, at the time we were writing Sex and City, we were all single, uh, really single. And so we were constantly putting our own stories into this. And and we all felt as single women, and then especially we brought it out in that episode, this idea that you get judged for your choices, that somehow as a single woman, you get judged, but if you get married, you're allowed to do whatever you want. And, you know, and we have to spend money to buy baby gifts and bridal shower gifts and all this shit. But if you're a, a single woman who says, you know what, I registered for my birthday, I want you to buy me these things. It suddenly it's, you know, it's all, everyone gets judgy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's one. Another thing that actually happened to me was I was renting an apartment and there were chickens on the roof <laughs> next, next to me. Yeah. And I would come to work and we, we worked at silver cup in long Island city. And I'd be like, these fucking, these bur- these chickens are making me crazy. Like I, ha- I cannot deal with it anymore. And I went over to the, there was like a vet clinic next door that stored the, ch- and by the way, this ended up in the story too, because they're not chickens, they're roosters. Yes. Yeah. 
Chickens don't make, but whatever. What do I know? Was the name of this episode Cock-a-doodle-doo? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But I went over and I said, listen, I, I am so sorry, but I really, the, the chickens and she's like, they're roosters. I'm like, okay, whatever. They're making a lot of noise. Can you do anything? And she's like, oh, well, we rescued them from, they were doing, you know, cockfighting. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's okay. That's a, keep them up there. They deserve it. They've, they've had, you know, and her answer was, well, they've had a lovely life. Don't worry about it. And that ended up uh, as a story, as a backbone for a story. But obviously we've all dated, look, there were plenty of guys that I dated who ended up on the show in mysterious different ways. Like um, Freak Show was definitely a, a panoply of men that I had dated um, along the way. And I dated a guy that I really liked, but he would yell at like service people. And I was like, you can't, like, he was really aggressive. Like he, uh-huh. was, he was an asshole. So he got he got thrown in the mix, too. So that was always dangerous when you dated one of us during the time we were writing the show. I mean, clearly the most infamous uh, transgression that one of the the boyfriends ever made, hands down, is the post-it, I'm sorry, I can't, don't hate me. Yeah. Um, has some, somehow, like, with, with the passage of time, has become, like, more and more iconic. Like, at the, I remember when that aired, and I remember, and I remember thinking, that is so stupid. I can't even believe they, like, wrote that. And now, maybe it's because with the advent of cell phones and you can just, like, ghost somebody. I think that this is a case where technology, it somehow is more realistic today. And people break up with each other on text all the time now. Which, thank God I'm not single now, because I don't know how, I, I, I don't even know. I can't even. But but yeah, I mean, that was at the time it was seen so brutal, but it's brutal now. now Did that really happen to one of the writers? You no, know, I have to remind, my, I have to ask the writer. I, I don't think, I think we came up with it. I don't think anyone was ever broken up with on a post it, but we were talking about kind of the idea of what being ghosted would look like. And it's that because this guy was also really passive aggressive. He, he kind of couldn't handle being articulate enough, even though he was a writer, um, to say to her, I can't do this anymore. So it was his way of getting out with a clean exit, which obviously it wasn't. Often we were writing things and we didn't know they'd become as iconic as they did, obviously. OK, let's move on to Miranda. A lot of, I have a very soft spot for Miranda. So Miranda to me was kind of like, when you say like, what parts of us are these different characters? I had a lot of Miranda and still do. I mean, there was a lot of things that that happened to Miranda that happened to me. But one thing that I think was pivotal to her was meeting um, Steve. And at the time that she had met this guy, Steve, who we didn't, by the way, think was going to be an ongoing character. Like we just were like, oh, let's have her meet a nice guy. Maybe he'll be around for a couple episodes. And it just kind of made so much sense for her to stay with him. But I was dating the guy who would then go on to be my husband. And a lot of the, the kindness of Steve came from my husband. Like there was moments where, and I can't remember actually even which episode it was at the end of where Steve says, do me a favor to just go look out the window and look at the moon. Um, yeah. and it was blooming and my now husband had done the same thing for me. Like he has a, a very calming influence and a, um, a lovingness to him that Miranda needed and that I clearly needed. So I think there was a lot of like of, somebody to soften each of you. Yes, yes, totally. And said, you know, take, take the edges away a little bit. Um, was he a bartender? No, no. <laughs> my husband is not a bartender, but he we introduced a lot of these these little stories of how how Miranda had to soften. She had to soften to become the next version of who she was and who she is. Wow, I love I love that Steve's like yeah. loosely based on your husband. Yeah, my husband. And Crazy. you know he is he is hands down like the most beloved guy. Yeah. On the show. <laughs> And I think a lot of that comes from David Eigenberg's performance as Steve. Yeah. Like he's, there's just so much about him that is so New York. Um, he's just like a fabulous actor. And I know that David Eigenberg has talked about how he came in, he was almost cast as like one of those throwaway guys, yeah. like over and yeah. over and over. And they kept never, they never cast him as one of those guys. And yeah. then suddenly he gets like the role of a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, this is what happened with a lot of the guys who would come in where it'd be like, ah, not exactly right for that guy, this guy. And then when David came in, honestly, we thought, okay, he'll be great as this one-off or, you know, maybe two episodes. And um, 
he was too good to ever let him get away. We got our hooks in him. And now, now we'll never let go. <laughs> okay, Samantha. Oh my God. Well, I mean, honestly, the, the uh, truly the thing I probably, it's not very funny, but I had breast cancer. And so yeah. the story for Samantha really evolved from um, my going through that while I was writing the show. And what was, I mean, how lucky was I to be able to write, basically having Samantha go through something that you're going through in real life is the, is like a superhero going through something that you're going through. So she got to do all of the like really brave things that I didn't really do. Like, you know, standing up in front of that group and ripping the wig off. wig off and even like showing up in pink wigs to shit. Like she kind of just owned it. And um, I think it was a, a great way for me to play out what I was going through. And I'm, I'm happy to see that it did have an impact on other women going through it. Um, but we were able to tell kind of stories that impacted the other characters too. Like the idea of the first time that you have a friend who's, who's kind of facing mortality, like that was really scary for Carrie. And I think it, it was a, a really great way to evolve the Samantha character, obviously, because again, we had to, didn't have to, but it was interesting to soften her and to give her Smith and give her somebody who, again, was going to be there for her, which is like the last thing she wanted was a relationship. So I would say that for sure was, um, that was, that was my, uh, one of my bigger contributions. Yeah. To, I mean, to that, some- that really was like one of the best overall arcs. My, one of my favorite episodes is the one where she's trying to get an appointment with like the best, uh, like breast yeah. surgeon, like in yeah. New York city. What did that come from? That you? happened to me. Yeah, that happened to me. So there was a woman and, and she may still be there, an oncologist who was the like oncologist to the stars. And I was like, I got to get in there. And it was saying it, it, it's very meta, right? Because I basically was like, I work on Sex in the City. And oh, that's what, my God. So it was funny that in the end, it was like her, you know, having to pull all these things to get in, get in with this woman. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, that was, that's amazing. Because yeah. she uses Smith Jared as like... Yeah. Oh, yes. my God. so it's like you use whatever celebrity you have to get what you need. And look, there was a point where we were kind of the toast of New York. Like it was such a great time to be in New York and be working on that show. And, um, you know, you get into whatever restaurant you want to get into. And it was fun. It was fun. But yes, that was that was that happened to me. Yeah. And OK, Charlotte. You know, a lot of Charlotte in me. I, I was raised on the Upper East Side. I did go to Brearley. So I kind of understood the Charlotte Trey relationship uh, very well. Uh, and I did name Bunny, the mother of, um, of Trey. And cause she's that kind of woman that you, you know, on the Upper East Side, it's like these crazy women who dress almost like 15 year old school girls, but mm-hmm. not sexy, I mean, like in kilts and like braids. It, there was well, something- she always wore like bows in her hair. Yeah, it was, it was something kind of iconic about those women. And I kind of miss that you don't see as many of them anymore on the Upper East Side. But um, so that world for, for Charlotte was one I, I really understood. I, you know, there's an episode where Charlotte dates a guy who is really good at oral and uh, Mr. Pussy. And that was definitely somebody that was we all knew about in, in New York at the time. Oh, he so. was like a real guy. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, that was his strong suit. So bless him. You know, that's what he went with. Um, but I, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other Charlotte things, but I think the thing that I, I understood, you know, she was more naive certainly than any of us were, but I appreciated her optimism. I think that she was an optimist and I, I like that about her. Uh, my two favorite characters, you know, during the time that the show was actually on, my two favorite characters, the ones that I related to the most, were o- always Carrie and Miranda. And and of course, I've like rewatched the series over, you know, the, the past 20 years, um, but not in like chronological order the way I really sat down. And in my rewatch, I came away with the most newfound appreciation for Charlotte. I think I never really paid attention to her so much because she was the furthest from me. But I I mean, I walked away thinking like, wow, Kristen Davis is really funny. Like she and Kim Cattrall have the broadest stuff to do. They really are the most comedic characters. And I think Kristen Davis is underrated as an actress. And the character, just, it, just saying this as somebody who initially like threw that character away, she was the one that I paid attention to the most. It's like I was seeing it with clear, like fresh eyes. 
Yeah, I think yeah. you're totally right. I mean, I think she was so under the radar and the character was easy to dismiss, right? But her comic timing and and it was it, she, the character was so important to have in this grouping because she represented a very specific point of view. And anytime we sat them in our what we call the coffee shop scene. So anytime we had those four women sitting around our table talking about one issue, she was always there to represent a very specific point of view on, on something. And maybe it would be a little backward or maybe it would be a little more naive, but it was also, as I was saying, like optimistic and funny and bright and a kind of a breath of fresh air, honestly. And she is, she is, and also by the way, a delightful person, a, a delightful human being. Yeah. Um, dude. So that is, that's a nice thing. I think the biggest misconception about sex in the city is that, it's it was entirely written by gay men yeah but when that yeah, the, yeah. when the truth is that it was actually entirely women plus michael patrick king and darren star in the beginning correct yeah this is one of the things that is i mean there are a lot of things that are frustrating about having done the show when we did it right and that was one of the things that i mean besides annihilating the work that like myself and other women were doing on the show. It's also such a backwards way of looking at the role that writers play, meaning uh, I think because it was sometimes body, sometimes very um, truthful and larger than life that somehow women, gay or straight women could not write that. It had to be gay men because that's how people perceived gay men to behave. So gay men behave this way, which is also wrong. All gay men don't behave that way. And therefore they had to have written the characters that way. It was such a fuck you. And it, it's still something that you can it still comes up and it's, uh, you know, there's nothing to be done except, you know, look at the names on the screen and see who actually wrote the episodes and, and, you know, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. But yes, that was something that, that was very hurtful to us. And I think another misconception is that Candace Bushnell had more of a role in the show than she did. And the fact is, she never wrote a single episode. That's true. What Candace did write the books and she did um, in the early days. So I would say in the first like season or two, she would come in at the beginning for a week or two and kind of talk about stuff. I don't think, to be fair, I don't think Candace has ever made any claims about anything. I think it's just the perception people have. Like Candace yeah. has been really supportive of the show and and we've been supportive of Candace and there's no there's no problem there. I think it's people's perception that she was more involved than she was. But no, she let us kind of take her characters and run with them, which was which was really nice for her because I think it must be hard to create something and watch it watch it run. In my sort of like study of Candace, it actually seems like at least today, like present day, she's kind of like she kind of runs around with a pack of Samanthas. Like she's <laughs> <laughs> like she's really good friends with like Countess Luann from the Housewives. Like she's she's friends with that with the New York Housewives, which we're going to talk about that later, um, okay. because I have very strong thoughts about the Real Housewives of New York being really sort of the continuation of Sex in the City. In fact, Candace was in an episode of the Housewives. Well, we'll get into it. But um, anyway, like I, I don't know that Candace is. I don't know where I'm going. But I have to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying about Candace that she actually like she lives in Connecticut. She likes to. She's a country girl. She likes to hang out in the woods and like I, I don't. I think there's more to Candace than how people's perceptions of what she what she presents. Yeah, and also her real life Mister Big broke up with her and like they didn't get back together that was a sort of a short-lived thing and it's kind of funny you can look up pictures of the guy who big is based on he's no chris noth in the looks department it's interesting that well look that's the beauty of casting right yeah when you cast the show you can kind of do the best of and um yeah yeah. Did, now, you as as a producer on the show did you have a role in casting oh yeah 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 i yes absolutely we, i was in every casting session. I mean, anytime you wrote an episode, you would cast your episode and I would try to be in casting on the other episodes whenever I could. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. this immediately brings to mind, cause I want to go down a list of the, the episodes that you wrote. Cause so many of them are of mine are favorites. You already mentioned a women's right to shoes, which I love is one of my favorites. You wrote the penultimate 
episode, the iconic episode of Splat. Yes. Did you cast Kristen Johnston in that role? Yes. And and to be clear, I wrote it with Cindy Shupak. So this was the only episode that Cindy and I wrote together. We were both individual writers on the show, but we had we had four days to write it. <laughs> so we wrote it together. That sounded weird. That sounded like we we're competing for who would write it. That's not what happened at all. <laughs> we both were excited. We were like super psyched and actually living like a half block away from each other in the village at the time. So we would like run between our apartments with different scenes and we had so much fun. Oh, but I yes, love that. We, we, we cast her and, um, and she was fantastic. I mean, she's exactly right for that, for the Lexi character, because she's so larger than life. And she played her so tragically. It was, it was great. Was Lexi Featherstone based on a real party girl? She was like an accumulation of party girls, right? I mean, at, the, at that time, it was kind of the, there was still like that bungalow eight kind of feel. And there were like girls in that world who were these kind of, still looking for that party from the from the 90s that doesn't exist anymore and she was one of those so it was it, she was an amalgam and just like where did the story come from that she would have you know eventually fall out the window like I, I, and there was so much going on in that episode this is when Carrie is dating Petrovsky and she brings him to this to this sort of lame party where Candace Bergen is who's her editor at Vogue is jealous she's like I should be with Petrovsky because of the age difference. She's like, why are you dating like the one guy that I should be with? But aside from that, talk to me about the whole scene where I'm so bored I could die and she falls out the window. Yeah, yeah, and she falls out the window. It was important because keep in mind this episode, and it was really, it was in a way very hard to write because we had a real fight between Miranda and Carrie. And we'd never really had a real fight like that between the two of them. And we needed... Uh, we had been setting up reasons for Carrie to decide that she was going to leave this iconic town that she loved more than anything. That was the fifth character in the show. And so we needed a character to come in and say the thing that would, and and do the thing that would be for Carrie kind of literally the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And we need to kind of say New York was over. And so that was Lexi's job was to literally be that person who's like, here's the tragedy of this person who stayed too long at the fair and literally falls out a window. And we didn't, ba- there wasn't like, I mean, you know, it's New York. There are always kind of people falling out windows. Yeah. Um, it's not like someone had, we weren't basing it on literally someone falling out a window, but we also love this idea that also people had stopped smoking. So the fact that she was still trying to smoke and get to the open window, I mean, it was all kind of this person trying to live a life that didn't exist anymore. And, but, but it was all in service of getting Carrie to make this decision that it's time. I'm going to go with him. I'm going to go with Petrovsky because there's nothing here for me. Did you feel the right, did the writers actually feel at that time that quote New York is over no 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 I okay. what we did feel though and I think we played it out like Michael did a great job in and I you'll know and because you've just rewatched them but we opened a season in the meatpacking district where they're eating outside of the meatpacking district and the, and the girls talk about how this used to be a meatpacking district and now it's like you know full of clubs like New York was ever evolving and that that was part of the fun of writing the show and the truth of New York. So we never wanted to say the New York was over, but the New York that was Carrie's kind of party town was starting to be over. I mean, for sure, all the foreign money comes and you've got these expensive apartments and it's just not, it certainly isn't. You can no like longer the, smoke indoors. You can't smoke indoors. It wasn't the New York I grew up in. That, that's for sure. That was way more fun and way more off the rails. So, but she would, we were never going to turn our backs on New York. Um, one final note about Splat, a friend of mine um, who I who I collaborate, my friend Damien, he interviewed a character actress who actually has a very small part in that scene. And she told him how in the choreography of getting Kristen Johnson out the window, that it was actually a rocket like stunt double. Yeah, it was really hard to do. And it was we shot it a bunch of times just to get it perfect to have that kind of the the drape moving in the right way and it was not a and you know what's interesting too here's a little fun fact it actually we had a freak snowstorm during the shooting of that episode so it it kind of really worked 
for it, it because part of this was kind of the quieting of New York. Like here's this crazy thing that happens and then it all went white. Um, so that actually did happen. And yes, we did have a, a body double that was doing a lot of the stunty work. We also had body doubles for asses and, and dicks. And we had a lot of, we had a lot of body doubles on the show. Yeah. Um, among the writers, were the, what were the bigger arguments that you guys would have? I mean, I guess the, the biggest argument among fans would be Big versus Aiden. What were the, some of the, the internal discussions or arguments that the writers would have? Like somebody feeling really strongly about one thing and somebody else really disagreeing. The, the, the Big and Aiden stuff was definitely an ongoing discussion for us. And it's it's interesting because the, those of us who started on the show were much more pro-Big than the writers who came in maybe two or three seasons in. And I get that. It, it's because of, I mean, Big treated Carrie pretty poorly. But, I mean, let's be honest, he was a shithead to her. But there was a chemistry they had that, hopefully the viewers felt as well that you kind of couldn't deny. And so we also didn't want, and nor did the the new writers want her to necessarily be with Aiden, but there was more of a, we would definitely go back and forth on that. And it's, it's interesting. A lot of the um, discussions we would have in the room would end up in coffee shop scenes. So like we talk about money, like all the issues that would come up in real life relationships, like would you loan a friend money? And what does that mean if you loan a friend money? Because you you had Carrie borrowing money possibly for to buy her apartment and things like that. And and um, to have kids or not have kids. And at what age is that something you think about? We would often analyze our own relationships in the room. And we were all like having shitty dates with people. But, you know, the idea of he's just not that into you came out of the room because... Yes we were talking about someone that one of the writers was dating and the guy was just not, he was not returning calls. He was not doing anything. And finally, Greg Barrett, who was uh, coming in once a week just to chat with us, um, said to Amy Harris, Amy, he's just not that into you. Maybe he's just not that into you. And it was like this light bulb went off for all of us. Like, wait, that's a thing. That's, oh my God, maybe he's right. But so anyway, we would have these ongoing discussions, both about our own relationships, but also things like Big and Carrie and the the idea of Carrie having an affair, which she never had. I mean, this was a this is another thing that I get frustrated by is that Carrie was blamed for the having an affair with Big when Big was the one who was married. Mm-hmm. So, yes, she had an affair, but she was not married. So right. it's almost Big got off scot-free and she as this beloved character but, but she did have an affair like she was she with Aiden. she was with Aiden they may not have been married but she was they were in a committed relationship yes right she had an affair but there was no blame on the men the men managed to get out free and she took the 90 percent of the blame which I get it when you take your lead who's everyone loves and you have her have an affair it's a big deal those are some of my favorite episodes the the Carrie big affair Th- th- those are some of the most compelling, dramatic episodes of the entire series. And you actually wrote two episodes that centered around that, particularly the episode where Big runs into Carrie and Aiden at the furniture shop. And he says, uh, he rolls up the, the piece of paper or whatever it was. And he's like, everything in my apartment is now beige. Beige is bullshit. I thought you wanted beige. Yeah, well doesn't quite fit. Have you got a smoke? I quit. Oh, we always used to share a cigarette together. We did a lot of things that were bad for me together. I have a secret to tell you. It's not working. I'm getting out. If you know anyone who's interested. How did this idea of her having the affair with Big come about and also like your involvement writing two of the key episodes around the affair? We knew that she was being pulled in this direction and that she had this chemical kind of attraction to not only to Big, but how she felt about herself when she was with him. I think she felt sexy and kind of zhuzhi, you know, which is a word that we would use a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, now it's funny looking back, you can say, well, 
Aiden was probably, he, he was the more mature person for her to be with, but she wasn't mature enough probably to see that that was the more stable relationship. She was attracted as many of us were, and many of us still are, to the thing that feels like the thing you can't have. And so that was the drive. It was like, uh, there's something unfinished here. And I, I keep getting pulled back to the flame. Listen, we've all been there. I mean, I certainly have been in relationships where I should have gotten out, but it was like, wait, I, if I just do this or that, it'll become the thing. And of course it never becomes the thing. It just tortures you, which it did for her for many years. And Michael Patrick King has said that he always knew that it was going to be big in the end um, and that they brought in Petrovsky because he was sort of bigger than big or yeah, whatever. Yeah, he was like the most different because he was an artist and creative, um, although Aiden was an artist, too, and creative. But what were where were you guys like, did you want her to wind up single? I find it very interesting, the ambivalence around marriage and children with Carrie, like, I, I would love for you to talk about that sort of that ambivalence in the writer's room, the, the stance among the staff. And also, was there a big push or argument among the staff that no, like, why does she have to wind up with anybody? Can't she just? Yes, yes, yes. We had all of those discussions. And like Michael, I mean, because I was there towards the beginning, I knew that I knew that we wanted her to be to end up if she was going to end up with somebody to end up with big, but there was a lot of discussion around Petrovsky too, because the decision for her to leave her friends, to leave New York and go off with this guy. It's like, what are we saying about her? Are we selling out the character in any way that we're going to feel uncomfortable with? Which is why we had to really do a lot of setup to explain what place she was in and how lost she was and how her friends in the end needed to rescue her right um but yeah we had a lot of discussions of what what it would look like if she didn't end up with anybody um we knew nobody wanted her to be married at the end of this that was not that's not what the show was about you really if you ask me what the end of the show is even though yes big goes and and they're together at the end right it you know go go get our girl it it really was the go get our girl which was what the show was which yes. was these friends saying we need to rescue our friend like it's about it was about female friendship in the end so yes big goes and gets her but i don't think that's really what the show what the series was about um but yeah we had a lot of discussions and we knew we didn't we had we, we spent a lot of time crafting the the end of petrovsky and the the end of the series to make sure that it felt real to what our characters would do did you have any involvement in the any of the movies, like no. as a consultant or anything? No, I mean, just as a, a friend. I mean, I was, you know, uh, Michael's a dear friend of mine, but no, I was not uh, involved in the movie. And was it an option for you or an idea? Like, was it even on the table for you? To, cause like, Because you, you're not a writer on And Just Like That, but was it even a conversation? Well, what happened was I have a show coming out um, called Welcome to Flatch. It will be on March 17th, uh, premiering at 9.30 on Fox. Amazing. Fox Entertainment, not the Fox Network that we don't care for. Um, so I was not available. So I, I, I've been producing, I've been shooting that show, and now we're going to air that show. Um, but um, Julie and Elisa, who wrote the show with me, and Michael, and they, they've been working on that show. Yeah. And I've been, you know, we're all very close, which is awesome to have made friends that you still value so much so um i'm i'm really supportive of what they're doing but no i i there wasn't an option because i was busy yeah um that was a sidebar finding the perfect skincare routine is never easy and it often takes a lot of trial and error depending if you're dealing with oily skin dryness redness acne and especially with the changing of seasons just trying to address all the skin needs you have to buy a ton of different products and it can be a whole headache. But I recently started using Proven Skincare. Proven Skincare's formulas are rooted in the largest beauty database, the Skin Genome Project. See, Proven Skincare is rooted in science. They've analyzed the universe of skincare by studying the effectiveness of over 20,000 skincare ingredients. All of this analysis results in Proven Skincare's custom three-step system that actually works. It includes a personalized cleanser, day moisturizer with SPF, and personalized night cream. This simple 
simple and effective system replaces a shelf full of products. Plus, your formulations are updated every eight weeks to evolve with you based on changes in your skin or environment. So give your skin exactly what it needs with Proven Skin Care. Go to ProvenSkinCare.com to take the free skin genome quiz and use code HOTTAKES for $20 off your first order. That's ProvenSkinCare.com, code HOTTAKES for $20 off your first order. P-R-O-V-E-N-S-K-I-N-C-A-R-E.com, code HOTTAKES. Now, I know one of my favorite side characters, I love that you brought up Bunny, one of my favorite side characters from the entire show is Magda. Amazing, right? Yeah. Amazing. Who created Magda? Like, where did this come from? The actress who played Magda was a friend of Michael's and she was amazing. And she passed away fairly recently, which was, she was, she was amazing. But we talked about Miranda having this relationship with her housekeeper and the, the story of the vibrator is something that actually happened to Cindy Shupak, one of the other writers where she had the, the, the vibrator was found and that was very uncomfortable for her. But she um, like moved it, like the housekeeper, like yes, moved it or exactly. something. Yeah. And then there was a Virgin Mary that was replaced there. Um, <laughs> but she was somebody who was almost like a mother figure. I mean, part, part of what we did on the show too, was we didn't want, it was about chosen family. So we didn't, we didn't want to really introduce people's relatives. Like you didn't meet, I mean, yes, you, you knew that we had the death for Miranda. That was a big deal, but we didn't meet people's relatives because this was your family. These friends were your family. So someone like Magda was almost like a mother or a grandmother, um, this kind of grounding force. And she ended up being really important, I think for the, for the show. And again, a character that we didn't necessarily think would, play out the way it did but she was great she was terrific loved her I know you you mentioned that she recently passed away when I was doing this whole rewatch I actually wikipedia'd her and I was so upset to see that she had passed away it it just like it affected me yeah I just love I just love that character right I know she was amazing now Another episode you wrote, which is actually like maybe one of my favorites, like of the entire series. And I didn't know you wrote it until I was like looking up the specific ep- episode that you wrote. The episode Coulda, Woulda, Shoulda. Mm-hmm. This is the one where Miranda discovers that she's pregnant and she's intending to get an abortion and in the final hour decides to keep it. Um, some people may at this point having watched and just like that, maybe wish that Brady didn't exist at all. But, <laughs> <laughs> but t- talk to me about this episode. Cause I have loved this episode for 20 years. I've loved this. One. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was, th- this was another one that was a lot of discussion in the room because we wanted to do justice to her decision. I mean, par- partly what we wanted to do uh, the questions of abortion or non-abortion aside, we wanted to always put in front of every character we had some, some kind of a, an obstacle that would challenge them to have to mm, relook at who, who they are and to test the things that make them most uncomfortable. And for her, we thought being a mother would really have to, again, soften her edges, um, slow things down, and so we knew we we wanted to do that. We also loved this idea that it was kind of against all odds, right? Like she had a lazy ovary. Steve had one ball. It should not have worked. This should not have worked. She says it's the Special uh, Olympics of conception. Yes, totally. It was like, how did this even happen? Um, and by the way, there was, um, we did know someone who had like a, a, a lazy ovary, which we did, like when these things come up, like anytime you wouldn't be in a doctor's office and they would say something like that, you'd be like, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Like, yes, you told me something bad, but I'm going to take that and go write it. Um, that was not me, by the way, with the lazy ovary. But, um, but we loved having those kind of things happen. We'd be like, this is a mana from heaven. But so we knew we wanted to challenge her with the child. And we thought, you know, here's an interesting dilemma. And we thought we could, we could get, I'm saying get away with, but what I mean is, you know, we wanted to make sure that we made it clear that this is a show that if you wanted or needed to get an abortion, that is something that was acceptable. And it was a big deal to say that like Carrie had had an abortion like that, which tells you how long ago the show, like there are things that absolutely date the show. And that's one of those cases where it was pretty amazing to have this character say, no, I, I had an abortion and to realize, oh, women did. So we wanted to make sure that we were saying to the audience, 
it's fine, whatever she decides. But this for her was the thing in her life at the time that she knew deep down she wanted. Whether or not she would be successful at it, she'd have to see. That's what took us towards that story. Hmm. The decision for Miranda and Steve to get married, where did that come from? Because now you're marrying off two of the characters. Charlotte was already married. Um, I guess she, she got remarried. And now the decision to marry another character, which is in a way flying in the face of the very ethos of the show, which is that you don't need a man, you don't need to get married. How, like, like it's in a way, it's very surprising that Miranda, of all people, would right. get well, married. Well, I think that's why it worked, right? Because I would say in none of these cases did they need to get married, right? That wasn't like that she actually really, over the course of a lot of ups and downs with Steve, really fell in love with him. It was like, I... I want to marry him. It was real. And I think it, it was, I mean, I hope it certainly didn't, I, I, I certainly hope it didn't appear that we were saying that you had to get married. I think in their case, they really, they were in love with each other and they had this child and they wanted to create a family unit. So when you guys go to, when the writer's room meets and like br- quote unquote breaks a season where you're coming up with the, like the big arcs for every character, can you go into the logistics of that? Like, how does that actually work? Generally what we would do in this, and I've carried this over into shows that I do now too, is we would kind of know where we wanted the season to end. And we would know, okay, this is the season where like, for instance, the Petrovsky season, we knew we needed to put her up against somebody new and somebody who, as Michael has said, bigger than big, we knew we needed to create somebody that could pull her apart from her friends but that she would end up at the end back with them. So you kind of, you know where you're starting, you know where you want it to end. And when we would know, we would start to talk about themes. Like our show was, as you know, you could tell from each episode, they were kind of thematic. And so there were certain times where it was about the girls pulling apart. Certain times they would come together. When we had a case of like Miranda with Steve, we would arc out kind of what we wanted from them for the season. So we would also know kind of where we wanted to end them up. And then we would have little pieces of arcs of stories that may not be long. Like when Samantha is, is dating Smith, that's like, you know, a chunk of her storyline. How do we want to play that out? And how's that play again? So each character, like quite literally on the board, you have the characters' names going down and then we go across and, and make sure that where they lay out, it tells a thematic story for each episode. If that makes any sense at all. No, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but we do generally, and sometimes with Michael and with myself as well, you almost can see what the final scene visually is. Like, you know, kind of where you want to end that person. And then it's about how do you, how do you get there? And sometimes things change, you know, like in the case of, of David Eigenberg, we didn't know that that would, Steve would end up being who he became. Um, And that's the fun of it. You hire some actors and then it takes it in a different direction. The idea that Charlotte winds up, she, she meets like the hot guy, marries him they have major sexual dysfunction, winds up getting divorced. Like this, all the, all her, all she wanted in life was to get married. She gets the yeah. thing and it's a disaster. And then winds up falling in love with the complete opposite of her type, winds up converting to Judaism. Like, where did all of this come from? Well, again, we wanted to challenge her and we wanted to take her out of this bubble that she was in. And we thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if she surprises us by falling in love with this funny, bright Jewish guy and really embracing Judaism? Like rather than it being like, I'm afraid of like the things that people might think she would do. She's actually like, no, I, you know, and her in the mikvah, like doing that mikvah scene was very emotional because it was her really surrendering to this new world and, and falling in love. So yeah, we, we really wanted to challenge each of the characters with the thing that would scare them. And for her, it was how she appears, right? Like, who is she? What's her kind of presentation? If she's not that girl, who is she? Um, it was fun. And um, going back to casting, where did you guys find the actor who plays Smith? 
He literally, I mean, we would have these auditions and we would see person after person. And a lot of times at that point, we were lucky that we were getting real actors who wanted to be on the show. Like it wasn't the first season was literally like begging people to come in because they, they, they were like, what is this? Is it a sex show? But he came in and we were like, oh, yeah, because there's a charisma to him that was undeniable. And it made so much sense to us why Samantha would be into him. But so he just came into a general audition and he had been a model mm-hmm. and he killed it. He was so real. I also really, really loved Samantha's story with Richard Wright. Um, like, where did that character come from? Although he's that's kind of like a stereotype and an archetype of a guy. But maybe the maybe it's the, the actor's performance that I'm so drawn to and their chemistry and how he really... Samantha in the end is able to like take her agency back and yeah. leave him. We, yeah. yeah. It was, it, we wanted to give her again, kind of the, it's like what she thinks she wants and then she loses herself in it and it's not that fun and it's, she needs to get her power back. Um, okay. So another thing that I wanted to talk to you about. So basically when sex in the city ended, just a few short years later was really when the Real Housewives took off and reality television became huge. Like, of course, the real world and things like this were on, but it really was the Housewives that changed the face of reality television. What is your stance on reality TV? And do you watch the Housewives slash Real Housewives of New York? Okay, I'm very pro reality TV. Um, so I support reality TV. I definitely watched housewives when it came out and I watched for like the first couple of years I got, I've gotten lost in other reality TV now. So specifically now I've gone down rabbit holes. Like I just watched singles Inferno, which is the like South Korean dating show where they put them on an Island. Well, anyway, I recommend <laughs> that also. So I've been pulled in different directions. I love the amazing race. Um, but I will always have a soft spot for all the original housewives. Cause I mean, I, I, and, and the Beverly Hills housewives I watched too. So the New York and the Beverly Hills ladies were my ladies. The biggest criticism perhaps of sex in the city is yes, women don't talk like this, or it's unrealistic. All of the, any sort of criticism about scripted TV. Now you have really a reality version in a way of sex in the city. I mean, that's what the real houses of New York is with stories that you could that are too insane you could never write well so here's my question though if that's true who's carrie oh easy there are two answers for you well okay. number one carol radswell okay 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 and you disagree number- the writer I don't, dis- I don't disagree i don't disagree but she wasn't one of the original housewives so i'm just saying oh me- no i'm not talking i'm just saying in the broad so, listen i've watched broad- 10 000, i've watched 10,000 seasons of this okay, i'm not, <laughs> I'm not- understood, understood i okay, would say okay. carol radswell is carrie she didn't want to get me- well she was a widow uh, actually strangely enough her, she's even more people have been saying she's Carrie for years she's even more relevant as Carrie today with the death of being a widow and she wrote a book called what remains about the death of her husband I mean it's the parallels are mind-boggling okay okay, okay so right. I'm making a very compelling argument here so I would say that and then I would say maybe Bethany if taking out mi- oh what are you saying is that no yeah, you don't really mean that. Because she's like kind of scrappy and like was always like looking for love in kind of the wrong place and trying to date these guys. No, you disagree. Uh, listen, I I think she lacks a certain heart that I would like to think Carrie. Mm-hmm. Has. Okay. Then I then I'm, then I'm holding strong with Carol, and I would say clearly Countess Luann has evolved into Samantha. <laughs> I <laughs> I. I think Samantha would have had the Countess as a good friend and would like be driving her to rehab a lot and be like, she's fun, but oh my God, she's really like taxing me. I think, I think, yeah, I think there's a, yes, I don't disagree that there's some Samantha there. I would like to think though, that in general, our girls had more heart than these women. Like these women are so cut, like our women don't have fights where they tip over tables. Like they don't, they don't right. snark each other. And that was really important to us when we wrote the show was that we had to be really careful. Like when I talk about the Carrie Miranda had a real fight, yeah. like they, they were very delicate about how they fought because they knew how important their friendships were. I, I mean, that's the difference. Reality TV, they want you to fight. 
And those ladies obviously don't disappoint. Jenny, this has been amazing. This has been so fun. Well, it's so interesting. Now I've got to think about the real housewives and how it applies to sex in the city. I mean, okay, here's my final, maybe I didn't articulate this well enough. If sex in the city had continued or basically, well, because we've had it, we would have to jump 20 years because the housewives are in their 50s and, you know, they're really in their late 40s and 50s. I guess kind of what they're trying to do now with them being that age, that's what the housewives has been doing for the past decade. That's my argument. Like everything, okay. like this is the real life version of they, some, they're married, they get divorced, husbands die. And there is this real comedic tilt to it. I'm talking specifically the New York housewives because that's the Got most it. literal translation. But I have just always felt that the audience that loved Sex in the City, the, the, the New York housewives, is the, that is what fe- – it's feeding the same craving. I think it feeds a certain craving, which is kind of that stylish, zhuzhy – out in the world, dating, soap opera world. But what I don't think it feeds, which I hope in the end is what our show fed, was the idea that women can have solid, fantastic friendships that nurture them throughout their lives. Well, yes, the housewives are all narcissists who want to be on TV, no, yeah, by, yeah. by any it's, means necessary. Yeah. <laughs> and want to steal each other's husbands and throw tables. And um, we are not, that is not our ethos at the Sex in the City writing table. Um, but I appreciate what you're saying. I hear you. I, I hear mean, you. Can you even believe that there's a, this real guy, Harry Dubin, that like three or four of the housewives have dated? Yeah, that would not have flown for us. We were very careful. To- no, I know. But it's crazy that this is real. Like, this is real. <laughs> yeah, this is real. And ladies, leave New York if that's what's happening. If there's only one guy. Go, go. Maine. Maine has <laughs> go to Maine. go to Paris in that case. Go to Paris and meet a nice, rich gallery guy. Just go, go. Have an experience somewhere else. Don't, don't, not everyone has to date Harry Dubin. And on that note, let's leave it there. Perfect ending. <laughs> You're the best. There. Thank you so much. I love your work. I'm such a fan. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure to to chat. And thank you for letting me think about you know, something I haven't thought about for a while, which is, which is so much fun. Please follow me on Instagram, JessXNYC. I have tons of videos of past interviews, the interviews with the Queers Folk Boys, Rosie, Isaac Mizrahi, Sandra Bernhard. Everything is over there on my Instagram. Um, So it's JessXNYC and Hot Takes Deep Dives. And thank you. Thank you.